Interesting tech. Yeah. Hello, and welcome to the next episode of The Prestige, a podcast about films, filmmaking, and film theory. In each programme, we'll focus on a particular movie, and we're going to review it and talk about it and the characters in it and discuss some of the ideas and themes that it might throw up. And as always, we'll end with our recommendations. These are films we recommend you check out if you uh, like this week's film. The link's going to be as close or as tenuous as we like, some based on theme or actor or director or whatever fancy we take. Brilliant. First of all, who are we and why should you listen to us? Um, my colleague on this podcast, um, 100 miles away from my office, but brought to you through the magic of technology, is um, Rob Maythorn. Rob's now a photographer, editor, publisher and IT specialist, but for quite a few years he was involved in the technical side of the movie industry, giving him insights like an incredible piece of editing trivia on last week's podcast. So if you haven't listened to that, go back and do it, because it's genuinely worth it just for listening to that. And the other voice you'll hear is mine. Uh, My name's Sam Knowles, and I'm a writer and teacher specialising in cultural analysis and race and politics in novels, graphic novels, comics, films, whatever. At the moment, my free time is mainly being spent on editing and admin for a special issue of an academic journal on graphic novels, race, nationality and migration. So that's something that is becoming more and more part of the public consciousness at the moment. Excellent. So Sam, this week it was your turn to pick the film. It was, and I chose the 99 film, um, an adaptation of a memoir that neither of us had seen, um, the adaptation of Susanna Kaysen's memoir of her time in a mental hospital in the 1960s, Girl Interrupted. Now, before we start, um, there needs to be a bit of a disclaimer here. Um, Although the two of us have experience, some small experience, either personal or through friends or family members in a small way of some of the aspects of mental ill health presented in this film we're certainly not medically qualified to talk about it oh no i'm not that sort of doctor so um <laughs> firstly if this is sort of thing you find discussion of too troubling then this is one podcast to miss out um mm-hmm. and also anything we say in the next 20 minutes or so is going to be focused on the cultural portrayal of mental illness rather than the mechanics, diagnosis and treatment of mental illness itself because we know nothing about that. No. So, um, that said, Girl Interrupted, as I said, is a 99 film of Susanna Cason's 1993 book of the same name about her time spent as an inpatient at a psychiatric facility in the late 60s. Now, I mentioned last week that the idea of whether or not this is based in reality was an important point. Um, And although the book is presented as a memoir, and Suzanne Kaysen was indeed forcibly interred in the 1960s, it's a central conceit of the book and of the film that her version of events may or may not be to be believed, which Mm -hmm. sort of handily ties into last week's film. Um, And um, I will talk a bit more about the adaptation from the book later on. Um, I hadn't, I'd neither seen the film nor read the book, and I thought I should do both. So I read the book, um, and uh, some some interesting discussions to come out of it. I think. Um, anyway, to start with, the film stars um, a very young-looking Willow and Ryder, although she's not actually that young. Um, it cleared Duval, who for a period in the late 90s and early 2000s was in absolutely everything, uh, including Rob's favourite film. She's all that. <laughs> um, Whoopi Goldberg as a, a strangely cast... Um, if you've read the book, it's a strange piece of casting. Um, a nurse on the ward. Um, a young Elizabeth Moss and um, particularly a young Angelina Jolie who won an Oscar for her performance. Um, it was directed by James Mangold and the screenplay was by Mangold and some others, loosely based on Susanna Cason's book. Anyway, enough waffling. Rob, what do you think? I kind of liked it, but in a way that I have no real desire to watch the film again. Okay. <laughs> um, there are films, things like... Um, 
Requiem for a Dream, which are brilliant, but are emotional journeys. And I think this was a interesting film, and I think it was a, a worthy film. But it's just not a film that's ever going to light my fire to rewatch. That being said, I think it was very good. I think that Winona Ryder was a producer of this film, and at times it felt a little bit like a star vehicle by her for her. Mm. Which I put nothing against. A lot of a lot of uh, direct a lot of stars are producers as well. Get the name out there. That's fine. I think that it was a good film, and I enjoyed watching it. I think it had some interesting things to say. I think a lot of the casting, especially, was spot on. Mm. I think Sam mentioned there that uh, Whoopi Goldberg it was strange casting. Um, yeah, but I, 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 so I just mean based on the character she is in the book, it's a bit fair odd, enough. But in the film, she's brilliant. I, I, I would say she's brilliant, and she has. If anyone is a fan of Star Trek: Next Generation, she plays a similar kind of character in that kind of wise and and sort of a mental character to everybody. I think she's great in this. I think. Winona Ryder is brilliant. I think Claire Duval and I think Elizabeth Moss are brilliant. I think all the kind of bit parts around them are really good as well. I think Brittany Murphy is very good in this role. I think that the film is an interesting collision of real world personality and on screen persona. In that you've got Angelina Jolie, who at the time was renowned for real world antics. Mm. You've got. Um, Rihanna Wider, obviously also known for outside of her characters being slightly kooky, slightly weird. And you have this, kind of, this collision of these people where you look at the character you, and you can see Winona Ryder and you can see Suzanne, the character, and they kind of line up. And the same with Angie Jolie. That at this point in life, she was crazy. She was kind of, she often until kind of Man Bad Pitt, renowned for being slightly out there and mad. And this film is this collision of these real world are using the personalities and the filmic personalities mm. that work we think work really well. Yeah. I think the film was very well done. I think particularly in the early, probably the first half an hour, you have this great sequence where she's slowly being taken into the into the ward and you cut back and forth between what's happening now and what's happening in the past and the future and it leaps back and forth but each time it jumps it jumps on a, on a line that links the two mm. and often this is used in films like, like a dream sequence like you think one thing's happening and, and then a character turns to you and says you need to wake up now and it cuts to someone waking up it's, it's a well used filmic trope yes, in respect. Yeah. but here it's she isn't asleep um, but I think it works on two levels in that you've got her obviously recalling the story of why she got to this point but secondly it kind of gives us a visual and an emotional connection to the confusion she's going through and that kind of scattershot kind of personality that they're trying to portray with her with her her sort of I don't want to say illness but her kind of mental health problem that, she, that they say she's going through mm. you get that feeling of just being all over the place life being hectic and scattershot and crazy and I think the editing in a great respect there. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Your thoughts on? Um, well, I feel like a lot of what I'm going to say is could be boiled down to I didn't like the way they adapted the book, which is the most, it, it's the most overused and boring response to any film of any book because, of course, it's not going to be like the book. It's an adaptation. It's a new artefact. It's a new mm -hmm. way to experience pop culture. So, as someone who does a lot of work with books and also with film for this for this podcast, I just I I get very tired of people saying that, um, and I get very tired of, for example, I don't know Harry Potter fanboys complaining that the films don't do a particular thing. Although actually, they, I, I believe I haven't seen the films, so I believe they're they're pretty faithful. Um, but but there'll be fans of big fantasy. Um, epics like that like Lord of the Rings for example where the the film doesn't fit someone's someone's notion of, of what the book is like um, so I should say a very very big um, caveat beforehand that I'm aware that I'm encroaching on this territory and I really don't want to be because I know that um, it's a it's a different artifact and in, even from from your initial reports there there's a lot to admire about this film, about the way this film is made. Um, 
I just think that this was a very 90s response to mental illness. Yes. Um, and I said, said at the beginning, nothing to do with diagnosis here, but I mean in the cultural representation of mental illness, this feels very like a film that would not be made nowadays. Um, and it, actually, the book, although the, the book was early in the film, the, the book is... Um, very much more progressive in the way that you you hear Susanna's thoughts, you hear Susanna talking about her mental illness. Um and one of the one one of the things about the film is that it sets it up as very cause and effect. You see, she attempts suicide, they incarcerate her, and her parents are around and involved in it and they understand that there's this cause and effect and Susanna has to go inside. Whereas in the book, she does attempt suicide. Eighteen months later, she or some period of time later, at least at least six months, probably over a year later, she um, is sent to this psychiatrist by her parents, and her parents are, are ashamed of having sent her. They don't go anywhere near her, and the doctor rigs the psych report. Uh, he says he spent hours and hours with her, and it turns out that he hasn't spent hours and hours with her. Um, so there's there's very little cause and effect in the book, and the book is a very interesting meditation on how people with a particular mental disorder that may not have been mental illness were nonetheless treated by people who were ashamed of them. And mm. it, it's a very interesting idea. She she has very interesting ideas about how about the way she was got rid of. And she's taken a whole lifetime to come to terms with this. Whereas, like you said, in the film, it's a very, it's an emotional journey that takes place over the course of the film and over the course of Susanna's incarceration. Um, and it's very, very cause and effect. And it's very, it, it felt more glib than the book. And the book had a very complicated and it felt to me interesting attitude to mental illness and it felt like I said that this film was a very 90s attitude to mental illness in sort of a right we know how to fix this let's go in and get this done and and we mm. can move on to the next thing I, I would say I, I, I would echo that I think that the film early on there's a scene in which they break in and they get hold of their own records mm. and all the patients sit around and read their own records and there's a lot of things around that especially with the the boyfriend who's being sent off to war around what is mental illness uh, is anyone ever really mentally ill mm. or is it just are we just different and i kind of liked where it was going that but I, I would agree with you that it kind of at some point throws that all away for the traditional 90s trope of you see something horrible or you have a, a dose of reality in in quotation marks and it sorts you out yes. and that that there is a fix and i think that the the film i i, I haven't read the book so i can't speak to how it is in the film but in the book but in the film it's very much we feel that she's clearly she's gone through this journey and she's okay at the end mm. and even with the character of lisa um who is the most certainly the most uh, electric figure in the film and certainly the most kind of almost vivacious character in the film that she, at the end, once again, gets a dose of reality from someone she trusts. Mm. And it doesn't, it doesn't cure her, it puts her on the path to recovery. Yes. And mm. it's the idea that this kind of feeling that somehow with all mental health, that, that this era portrayed, that there's a fix. That there's a, if you put someone in the right situation, show them the right thing, say the right words, mm. that it can be fixed. And I think that, once again in the real world of mental illness in my experience that isn't the case there isn't a fix to a lot of these things mm. yeah but the film does early on have ideas around the, and then there's a great speech by Whoopi Goldberg which says you aren't crazy you're just trying to be crazy yes it's just, there are some there are some brilliant moments in this film that are certainly not in the book and that is one of them um, mm. and and it's just it's just a bit frustrating like you said there are so it it falls for the the nineties trope of it being ha having a metaphorical dose of cold water over you, and you think, oh, this is what reality is. And mm. in in the film, there's there's a moment with with the death, 
Um, and in the book, that doesn't happen. Polly does die, but she dies off screen, as it were. And she mm. and the girls get told about that by the nurses. And it's not nearly as central to their lives. Um, so, it, like, like you say, it, it felt like they, they'd they sort of engineered it to be much more 90s-like by the end. Mm. And it, that also, we've talked in the past about adaption. And I think this is an interesting one because in the past we talked about adaption being adapting from a from a book to a to a movie. But here, obviously, this is a real world real world story. This is a true story in many ways, um, with a given value of true. And so, in a book, you can allow her to sort of have these five or six different characters. Whereas, obviously, you come to a film, you've got to cut down. At a certain point, you've got to focus on a few stories. And I, mean, I haven't read the book, so I didn't feel that same kind of loss. Of the um, of a uh, character, and I kind of got where they focused on. They uh, understood why they, if you're saying they weren't, they didn't see Polly's death, but they do in the film because of that need in the '90s to have a clear cut answer. Mm. And I think that there, there, there's a whole a theory. I suppose I have, I personally have around the '90s and the 2000 period is that it was kind of a weird kind of lost era. And as me, me and Sam grew up in the '90s, and there's a reason I feel why films like Fight Club were big in that era because it's about this dissatisfaction and disaffectedness of, of people mm. that we as as a society and a culture didn't have. The 80s had you know had, you know money, power, greed, that stuff, and we're kind of hitting a point now where I feel in the last ten years, whilst we haven't got a direction, we have got this unifying force of of the global economic crisis, the sm- the rise of technology. But there's this the, the 90 to 2010 era in which we were kind of just winging it. And that's why I think we've got this rise of these films where there's a nice, neat tying up of the bow. And the, the, the idea that if you found this one thing, this one moment, or this one phrase, that it unlock everything for you. That it would give you direction mm. and hope and dreams and that sort of stuff. And it obviously isn't true. But I do think that's that's a product of that kind of global especially in the western so the western zeitgeist are just being a bit lost mm. and it's kind of it being a bit of a nothing era yeah um and i think it gave birth some great culture and I, I i'll defend that era to my dying day but i think there was a a kind of this weird feeling that suddenly the world's opened up to us and we could do anything we wanted but with that meant that we couldn't we could do anything and we kind of were paralyzed by the choice yeah yeah gen x or gen y as we're often known yeah that's that's an interesting one. There are lots of, I'm just thinking there there are lots of counter examples to that. But there there is a, a vast majority of films produced in that period where having an answer was the right thing and was yeah. was the end the end product. And that's something about the book that, as I said, she it's it's an ongoing process. Um, and actually, the, the line, although it is a good line from Winona Ryder right at the beginning, girl interrupted, that is entirely not what it means. Um, and girl interrupted comes out of a visit that Susanna Cason later goes on to an art gallery, like 15 years later. So it's it's about the process of her life and mm. the evolving of, of her life, the development of her character, the fact that she hasn't got answers. I think that was something that that you're right that this film definitely did have. It it very much wanted to have an answer for everything. And I think that it also played into some some kind of tropes that uh, are are less favourable, and and the idea of this kind of one first of all certainly is 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 the the wise and magical black person mm. um, that. You see again and again in film, less so these days, but I mean, particularly in, in this era, you know, the Legend of Bag of Vance, that kind of film where you know that that, that the idea that that black people somehow are magical, and we see all this obviously as, as two white guys in England, um, Green Mile, and there was this whole kind of trope for a while of 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 the magical black person, and I think Whoopi Goldberg can certainly fill that role a little bit, mm. and I think that there's. Also, with um, Angelina Jolie's character, the idea of, of of kind of 
I suppose, as it's often called, the noble savage or the wise savage mm. in that she's she's so far out there and she's so wild, but that wildness gives her clarity and it gives her answers. And I think the film does some great work to kind of break that down and kind of point out that actually she doesn't. Mm. But early on, I was really worried they were going to go down that route of, well, oh, the, oh, the blessed are the crazy, they let in the lights, that kind of idea that by being really crazy, she actually saw all the truth in the world. Mm. Um, so I think the film, as we're talking about sort of mental health, doesn't glamorise it, which I was worried it was going to do with her character. Um, but it also doesn't seem to know what to do with it. No, I did like at the end when she keeps repeating... I'm free, this is what freedom is, I'm free, I'm free. And the response is, you're definitely not. And that's not mm. just the response of Winona Ryder's character, it's the response of the director, it's the response of the audience. We know by the end that Lisa is definitely not free, as much as she thinks she is. I think there are some interesting ideas about freedom in the film. You've got, I mean, Polly's character, who ultimately essentially gets out. She's the one person who gets out of the, during the film, gets out of the, I um, mean, permanently. She isn't escaping, she just she gets out. But it's very clear that once they visit her in her house that she hasn't in any way escaped the things that are going on in her life. Mm. Yeah. The, the, the change of the scenery, I mean, hasn't freed her. And that I think that was why it was so disappointing to me when Winona Ryder kind of became free and got out. That everyone else felt like, actually, you know what, this, is, this isn't something you just walk away from, this isn't you just escape. Mm. Um, but it, it, the... Polly's character sort of I really had home that while she was now out in this nice house she liked she still was the same person and the same problems mm. yeah the, it, those those problems being sort of focused on her father which I, mm. I quite like that so the the needling of uh, the Lisa and actually it's it's Daisy not Polly I get them the, the other way around so I'll put Polly's the the um, Polly's Elizabeth Moss is Daisy in the house. Fair enough. Um, but I quite like the the needling that you get from Lisa to Daisy, um, mm. which and and that's uh, that's part of the screenplay, not the book as well. That's a um, that's a really interesting thing. And they they sort of there are rumours about Daisy's relationship with her father, but. It mm. takes it takes Lisa in the film to spell that out. Um, so I, re- I, they, as I said, there there are moments in this film that I I really I really liked it. Un- unfortunately, there are things like um, there'd be a, a brilliant Whoopi Goldberg speech when she says something along the lines of, um, "Well, you're not crazy. You're just trying really hard to be," and then Winona Ryder sort of slips into taking the mick out of a black person and. We're going to throw in a very, very late 1960s reference and it, there's about to be a shot of Martin Luther King Jr. And then in 20 minutes time, Winona Ryder will come to her senses and she realise she's not allowed to call other American people the N-word. It just felt yes. that, that I didn't like that at all. Um, that, that, that's a, a general annoyance of mine that any period film must show all the characters watching something important on the TV. Yes, yeah. Uh, but that's that, that's an issue I have. Just while we're before we kind of wrap up, I want to say with one more thing into the mix that we haven't discussed here, which is costume. Okay. And one thing that this just for the, the people who are here for more kind of the technical, more kind of the filmmaking side of things, it's very interesting if you watch the costumes of the characters early on. If you look at the long-term residents of this ward, almost all of them are in block colours. They're almost all in like a plain white, a plain grey, a plain beige top. They all wear block colours. Mm-hmm. And they're almost always quite light. If you go outside the um, the wards, then everyone's in much darker colours. They're in dark suits, in their leather jackets. They're much more darker, darker colours. And then you've got when I write a character who, for a large part of the start of the film, wears stripes. Very right. If you see her when she first turns up, she's wearing a black and white striped top, and she can alternate between being wearing all colours and black and all that stuff. And I think they did some interesting work about having her kind of pitched as this kind of this the fulcrum between these two worlds, mm. where she, her costume kind of marches part of the ward but also part of the outside. And I think they 
it does tie into the idea about how maybe she's the one that isn't crazy and the others are crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, and the idea that she, she's making herself crazy. And you see in the film she kind of embraces the whole wearing block colours and then not towards the end. Mm. But I think that if people are looking at for more of like a, a on-screen filmic sense, they did some great work with the costumes and kind of having that undercurrent running where she's slightly different from all their patients, but also slightly different from everyone in the outside world. Mm. I had not noticed that. I, I, the thing I noticed was the colour. Um, there's there are lots of sort of block whites and beiges in the ward, mm. and then you go outside and it's it's richer and darker and. We have lots of shots of New England full leaves. Um, it's meant to be New England. I mean, it feels very Vermonty the landscape. Yeah. Um, and then you go in in the in the ward, and it's it's bright and harsh and unforgiving and and light as well. So I noticed that, and I hadn't hadn't picked up on that bad costume. So so that was that me early on. Um, Right so, then. Sam. Yes. Recommendations. recommendations. Further reading. Recommendations for the week. Um, I've got hmm, three. Which shall I go? Oh, you can know, have all three anyway. Um, one of them is a film which I think does very interesting things with with mental health, with um, whether or not someone's crazy or not. Um, and it's a very stylishly produced film. Um, it, it may be another one that I'm not in a hurry to revisit, but I remember it making an impression on me at the time. It was, it was out a few years ago. It's, it's the film Shutter Island. Mm. Um, the second one is a link to the director. It's also a mango piece. And it also focuses on um, a real-life story. Is, is Walk the Line, which I do really enjoy. Um, and I know this is another one that is not necessarily true to, to real life, but um, and, and there have been complaints from, from the Cash and Carter estates about this, but uh, I thought it was, a, it was a really interesting piece of work. And finally, um, going back to this sort of idea of an emotional journey and female adolescence, and also because you complained recently that there weren't enough um, buildings from Mana about um, women, which I think I think, yep. I think you're right on actually. Um, is is the recent film Juno? Ah. So three three fairly recent films actually, as in the last decade or so. Fair enough. I, I, I thought in your three you might catch two, so of mine, but you haven't, luckily. Good. So my two, two recommendations are taking the first one, looking at how film portrays mental health, and I don't, I'm not sure this film is any better, but it is an interesting film to watch. Is the 2001 film A Beautiful Mind? Okay. Yeah. Starring Russell Crowe as uh, John Nash, a uh, infamous and sort of very talented mathematician. Um, and he gets sort of pulled into under cryptography and dealing with his mental health issues and various sort of, I suppose, ticks and quirks of, of what makes somebody that genius yet at the same time so troubled. So I think that's worth watching. Mm. And I have also picked a kind of coming-of-age film, um, and it's one that I didn't think of at the time when I was, I was ranting about it on Twitter, but it has come to me since. And... It's not massively well known, um, and I'm not, I wouldn't want to guarantee that Sam's heard of it. Um, but it's a 2003 film called Thirteen. No, nope. never heard. Of it. Starring Evan Rachel Wood and Holly Hunter, and it is about a 13-year-old girl who falls in with another girl, who and they kind of go on this trip of of sex, drugs, petty crime. Um, it's shot in a very similar style to Kids. It was written by one of the stars about her experiences growing up as a as a 13, 14 year old character. Mm-hmm. It is has a similar sort of being pulled along by a magnetic but destructive personality. And I think it's an interesting and often forgotten film. So 13 uh, from Ka- by Catherine Hardwick, who did go on to make Twilight, but don't hold that against her. <laughs> 
Um, it's an interesting film that deals with some of the kind of female bonding and destructive personalities kind of ideas. I um, I heard Mark Kermit talking about um, Catherine Hardwick recently, and he was saying that um, actually he quite enjoyed the first Twilight film, and that was mainly down to her, and he kind of wishes that she'd stuck around because they weren't very good after that. No, no. So it's my choice next week, mm-hmm. and I'm torn between doing a recent film or an older film. And I think I'm going to go for the recent film. Okay. So next week we are going to talk about The Martian. This is something that I have looked forward to for weeks and weeks. Not only talking about it here, but also going to see it in the cinema. So I look forward to that. I have seen it already, and I will reserve my judgment for next oh, week. Right. Okay. Um, but till then, guys, if you want to chat about this, um, and obviously this week more than most, if we have made mistakes or we have glossed over things or taken things wrong, please come and tell us. Um, not only as film critics, but also as human beings. So come find us on Twitter. Yes. You can find both of us at Prestige Podcast. You can find me at Life underscore Academic. And you can find me at Rob Kaiju. Brilliant. And we will see you next week. See you then, guys. Prestige is a Kaiju Industries production. Check out their other work at facebook.com forward slash Kaiju Industries. Rawr.